I'm going to um, uh, do a bit of a, a kind of com compare and contrast across uh, open data and open source and uh, a little bit beyond um, just to see to think through what we might learn from different approaches um, uh, and how we can um, encourage these different communities to, to work together effectively. Um, so um, just to give you uh, a little bit of background on me, um, you can date me from the, the particular Lego range that's on, on, on show here. Um, but I just wanted to kind of uh, give a bit of context to, to, to my talk. So um, I've got a background in software engineer, I spent the uh, initial part of my career building platforms to aggregate um, and publish data in various ways. Um, used a lot of open source um, technology and tools as part of doing that. Um, I was working in publishing at the time, um, so around when the open access movement was starting to become more prominent. Um, so I started to get interested in other other ways of um, openly licensing content um, and then got involved in uh, some early bits of open data, um, some community projects, things like OpenStreetMap and Music Brains, um, and then later um, joined the Open Data Institute where I've been in various roles since about 2012. Um, so I've always been interested in the kind of interplay between open source, open data, and other um, open um, open things. Um, at the ODI, if you don't know very much about us, um, we are not-for-profit, headquartered in London. Um, we um, uh, work uh, internationally um, with both the public and private sector to build an open trustworthy data ecosystem. So we're a mission-driven organization, um, and basically we want to build a world where data works for everyone, where we can get the maximum value of data for society um, whilst minimizing any harmful impacts. So protecting people's privacy, national security, commercial interests, that kind of thing. Um, so that, that's kind of a bit of background. Um, so what I'm gonna try and cover in my talk is um, position open data as part of um, um, what, what, what we sometimes refer to the ODI as kind of open culture. Um, do a bit of compare and contrast across open data and open source. Look at some of the, the, the common areas, common challenges, um, and the ways that the different open approaches can support and enhance one another. Um, and then up by talking a little bit about data infrastructure and data ecosystems. Um, so, uh, like Ian, I have a, uh, an opening uh, slide with a definition of open data. Um, this is a slightly different definition. It's the one that um, the ODI uses. Um, it's um, essentially the same as what's in the formal definition of open data, which is uh, at opendefinition.org. Um, we've just condensed it down to something that's um, um, a, bit, a bit simpler. Uh, so, data that anyone can access, use, and share. Um, the open definition um, is um, aligns with um, the open source, uh, open software definition, um, um, uh, and other kind of open definitions that have been created by different communities. So when we say open, it means the same thing as it does in the open source community. Um, when we're talking about open data, we often also talk about um, what's called the data spectrum. Um, so recognizing that not all data can be open. Um, some data is closed. Um, information about what you get paid uh, is probably only shared between you and your manager and HR. Um, sales reports and things are the sort of things that are only shared within a, uh, in a closed way within an organization. Um, and at the other end of the spectrum, you've got open data. So bus timetables, transport information, um, uh, information that can be uh, easily uh, uh, shared because it doesn't have any uh, personal information attached to it. Between those two extremes, there's quite a lot of um, scope for sharing data in different ways um, by uh, specific contracts or for use by specific communities, perhaps by researchers. Um, one of the reasons that we've uh, used this diagram and, and this kind of framing is it helps to position open data as something that is not um, not distinct or apart from the kinds of activities that 
uh, lots of organizations engage with already. So sharing data and information internally or with business partners um, and others in their, in their ecosystem. So it's, it's hopefully highlighting that open data is a progression um, of the, those kind of activities. In open data, we use open licenses. Um, but when we're sharing data, we use other forms of, of contract and agreement that, that describe how um, how data can be shared, how it can be used, and so on. But um, an open license gives um, complete freedom uh, for someone to use data for, for any purpose at all. Um, so that's open data. Um, I said I wanted to talk about kind of open culture. So it's just the kind of phrase we've used occasionally at the ODI. Um, and what we mean here is a whole range of different um, uh, approaches, tools, um, movements that have openness at their core. Um, and I wanted to just kind of talk about a couple of these um, just to highlight um, um, some of the common aspects to them and, 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 as I say, to draw some distinctions between open source and open data. So I'm just going to talk about open standards, open source, open data here, but there's obviously other things that we could talk on, um, things like uh, open access and broader ideas of uh, open knowledge and um, open culture, uh, um, sorry, free culture. Um, so open standards, um, we do quite a lot of work on open standards at the ODI, specifically around open standards for data. Um, so we describe open standards as being reusable shared agreements that can help us to collect, share, and use data. Um, uh, the reasons for de developing open standards um, are varied, um, and this is going to be a, a theme across these different, uh, different approaches. Um, so we might uh, create open standards to help us reduce the costs of accessing, using, or sharing data, because data is organized consistently, so it makes it easier to consume um, in different tools, uh, makes it easier to publish because it's in consistent formats. Um, but we can also use uh, open standards to um, um, create um, opportunities for new products and services, because if we standardize how data is being managed, then we can create tools that can um, use that data because it's stored in a consistent way. Or if data is being published to a consistent format, then we can create products and services that aggregate and analyze that data. Um, it, so it reduces the cost of bringing those new products and services to market. Um, um, enforcing and encouraging use of open standards can also create more, um, more opportunities for people to create new products and services. So um, initiatives like open banking have um, helped to create a, or help create a movement towards a more open um, finance and banking sector. So there's a whole raft of what, reasons why um, uh, communities, uh, policymakers might um, encourage um, the creation and adoption of open standards. So we can see open standards as a, as a tool uh, that can be applied to achieve different goals. Um, open source is the same. So in open source, uh, I don't need to define it for this community. We're working together to create reusable code and applications. And there's a whole range of reasons why um, people choose to open source code. Um, it might be just to share the work of creating high quality software because we can collectively um, collaborate on a code base. We can spot and fix bugs quite easily. Um, but open source has also been used to uh, build and create markets as well because we can create open source platforms that allow people to compete around the provision of services. Um, uh, that use those platforms. Um, open source can also help um, with transparency. So NHSX opening up the source code for the, its contact tracing app has helped to, has helped to uh, build people's confidence in how that application has been put together, whilst also giving opportunities for other people to explore the code base to help highlight uh, potential security issues. So like open standards, open source is a, a tool and methodology that can be used to support a variety of different um, aims, uh, achieve a variety of different goals. Um, the same is true for open data. Um, Ian has, has highlighted a number of those in his talk, the reasons why governments, communities, um, and cross-sector initiatives choose to um, use open data as part of trying to achieve their broader their broader goals, broader purposes. So um, 
there were, that, as Ian highlighted, the early um, early reason for um, for um, a pushing for open data in the UK government was around transparency. It was to uh, give some uh, insight in how government was spending money or um, how MPs were filing their expenses, for example. Um, but that's evolved over time, and now the agenda is much more about um, innovation. Um, but it's, it's useful to recognise that open data means something very different for different communities. While we might share a, a common definition that we can, it gives us the freedom to access and use and share data for any purpose. We, we're trying to um, use open data for different uh, to achieve different goals. So the um, the, the community. Uh, working in the scientific community using open data, they're not really trying to drive innovation or transparency. Open data for them is a way to help to build on each other's work and insights to um, um, improve the re reproducibility of um, uh, experimental research and, and insights so you know they can check each other's homework, for example. So sometimes I think it, we get a bit, we don't really recognize those benefit, those, sorry, those different um, goals when we're talking about um, what open data is or should be, um, because different communities will have different data sets and different reasons for wanting to share their data. So it's important to understand that kind of context of how we're using open data in the same way as it's important to understand the context of why we're developing an open standard or choosing to open source a code base. So open culture um, for me is about this set of tools and approaches that use the freedoms that are granted by the application of open licenses and um, collaborative approaches, um, ways of working to address a variety of real world problems. So um, quite often we need to combine these, um, these different approaches to actually Fully realise the, the the goals that we that we're setting out to achieve. So um, let's do a bit of uh, compare and contrast. So um, just give a, a few examples from things that I've um, I've seen and and worked on recently. So um, if we compare open source and open data, what kind of useful um, insights can we get? Um, well, the thing, the thing that um, I think a lot of people miss is that um, the, open, the model, the, the pro predominant model for opening data is very different to um, what we do when we're open sourcing software. The, the, the predominant model for open data is a, a single organization will um, collect um, some data and then it will publish it uh, for other people to use. Um, the, the equivalent in open source would be um, an organization um, uh, developing a code base internally and then every so often releasing a version of that code base for other people to um, other people to use but not necessarily con necessarily contribute to so that not for most open data sets if we find a problem we can't fix them or if we fix them we can only do it in a fork of the data because the original publisher is not ready to take on um, contributions back to the original data set. So the way that open data is being used um, is very different to, to what's happening with open source. Um, for in, in the main, in, in most ways, and particularly around how uh, government data is being published. It's not true of all communities. Um, so we often uh, now point to something we're calling collaborative maintenance. So this is where communities are um, embracing open data in a similar way to the open source movement works. So broadening out um, those freedoms to not just include the ability to access, use, and share data, but also the ability to get involved in the work of collecting and managing data sets um, more directly. So there's a lot of like uh, good examples of, of communities doing this for, for many years. So OpenStreetMap, um, um, Wikipedia, projects like Music Brains. But the ways that those projects work um, it feels very localized to those communities, whereas the this approach, this tool, this methodology, if applied correctly, might allow us to create um, wider impact in other contexts. 
Um, so I'm very keen in exploring what these more collaborative approaches to collecting, using and managing data might involve in, in the private sector and in the, in the public sector. Um, just to give you a flavor of different, um, different approaches that people are taking, I've got three uh, quick examples. Um, so uh, Ian's already mentioned uh, humanitarian open street map, so I won't dwell on that too much. Um, but this is a, 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 I guess, a smaller initiative within the broader OpenStreetMap um, project movement um, that's focused on um, collecting data to support humanitarian activities. So quite often um, as part of disaster relief efforts. So there might have been an earthquake or a flood. Um, people on the ground who are providing support need up-to-date information about where the population is. They need um, good maps to help them get aid to where it's needed. So um, here people are collaborating in um, looking at satellite imagery and using that to directly update the OpenStreetMap database in ways that can then be easily used by um, first responders who are involved in uh, addressing, in, um, sorry, providing disaster relief. So there it's a, a much, it's a, a very direct kind of collaborative approach. Um, as a bit of a contrast, slightly different uh, example is Mozilla Common Voice. Um, so this is about um, letting people collaborate in creating a openly licensed data set of voices to help improve the design of voice recognition apps. Uh, and the reason for engaging in, in collaborative maintenance here is different for, um, for the humanitarian OpenStreetMap community. Um, whereas the um, RSM community need to um, share the work of uh, collecting and updating that data uh, as widely as possible to make sure it can be um, that work can be done quickly. The goal here is by literally allowing a diverse set of people and voices to be added to the data set. So by making it more open for people to contribute, we end up with a higher quality data set that will be more representative of a wider community. Uh, and then my third example is a, a public sector example. It, while the data set itself is open, the process of contribution is, is um, not so open. So there's a data set managed by Department for Education. Um, it was called Edubase, and I've left the name in. I think it's now called like the Find, Find Your School Service or something that's slightly unwieldy. Um, but it's a, basically a big directory of um, all schools across the UK. Um, while Department for Education are the steward of that data set, um, their responsibility for maintaining it, actually individual, uh, the work of, of, of maintaining individual records in that data set is um, delegated out to the individual schools, to the headmaster or some administrator <clears throat> in the school. So the reason for doing this is the people in the schools, the people closest to the data, you know, will know when um, important information has changed. Um, are the best people to keep that data up to date. Um, by spreading the work around, it avoids the need to try and um, coordinate the, the maintenance of that in a central and a centralized way. So those are three very different, different, different projects that are, in, are making it more open, to, more open to a broader community in maintaining data. Um, so we've been looking at some of these projects to look at what kinds of work can be shared when we're collaboratively maintaining uh, data, when we're treat, treating data more like an open source project. So communities can get involved in deciding what data to collect, um, making sure that they feel comfortable with um, that how data about them uh, might be representing them and their needs. Uh, people can get involved in the data collection, you know, um, looking at satellite photos, um, surveying their streets, um, uploading their record collection and so on. The maintenance and quality control of the data can be shared as well. People can fix, directly fix errors. Um, and even the governance uh, choices of, over how um, data sets are being managed, how access is being managed can also be more widely shared across communities. Um, and the last point in the slide is around community building um, because one of the, one of the, uh, the common aspects between these collaboratively maintain open data sets and open source projects is the need to build communities around them. You need a good set of 
people they need a, a good set of contributors to keep the project alive. Um, so the work that we've done at the ODI to look at collaborative maintenance, we published that recently in a guidebook, um, which is a set of design patterns um, that are intended to help people design systems um, and services that allow people to collaboratively maintain data. So there's some examples in there that, that talk about how and when you might um, choose to use collaborative maintenance when it's appropriate, when it might not be so appropriate, and a whole range of different design patterns that cover things like contributions to data, governance, quality control, and so on. So if you're more interested in that, then I encourage you to take a look at that. Um, so that's a bit of a contrast between open data and open source. Um, so what about some uh, common aspects? Where are there some common challenges? Um, so the main one for me is sustainability. Um, there seems to be a, an ongoing uh, discussion in the open source community around some of the sustainability issues with um, open source projects. Um, it's difficult to get funding and investment in, in projects. It can be difficult to get ongoing community engagement and support for um, open source projects. Um, lots of projects might only have a very small number of committers or perhaps even a single person that is, that is trying to keep the whole thing up and running. Um, and tied into that is it can be very difficult to measure the impact um, of um, open source projects because literally anyone can use, the, use that code in, in, any, in any way, in any system, and you just sometimes just don't know how or where it's being used. Um, the, the difficulty of measuring that impact makes, then contributes to the problem of trying to find funding and investment to keep the whole thing up and running. Open, lots of open data projects have exactly the same issue, and particularly those that are using collaborative maintenance. Um, with the with predominant model of single organization responsible for all of the data collection and all of the publishing, it means that all of the costs fall onto that um, organization as well. Um, there are you know, notorious uh, difficulties with trying to measure the impact and use of open data to put some more detail to some of those um, um, economic analysis that Ian highlighted in his talk, um, because when somebody can just take the data and walk away with it, it's very hard to kind of trace um, what people are doing. Um, and it's part of the, the broader open definition that you shouldn't really have to you know, register or sign up to um, access some data, which uh, makes it just harder to, to monitor those uses. So there may be things that the communities can share and learn from one another in trying to address these uh, sustainability uh, challenges. Um, so, so that's kind of, I guess, common issues. Um, so what about um, how we combine approaches together uh, to create larger impact? Um, so um, open data, open source, open standards are often go hand in hand. Um, so Ian mentioned the 360 given uh, project. So that is about has involved creating an open standard to support people in opening up data in consistent ways. There are lots of other similar projects that are starting from the same point. The green open standard to help that support their community in um, in consistently making data available. And then they're often also providing open source tools just to help people um, analyze and aggregate the data that is, is published. Um, many of the, or most of the open source, uh, sorry, um, open portals for the uh, people are using to publish open data are based on open source software. So open source software is part of the technical infrastructure that is helping um, to, to create, helping us to create value from open data. So while these are, there are different approaches, different communities, we need to think about how we combine them in order to maximize impact. Um, at the ODI, we talk a lot uh, about uh, data infrastructure, um, which some of you might have, have, have heard myself or others talk about um, uh, before. Um, so uh, uh, Vice President Jenny, Jenny Tennyson has a, a nice analogy that um, I'm gonna uh, roll out again. Um, so we, um, um, so we tried, so the idea we're thinking about data as a, um, as, as infrastructure, 
uh, as a kind of virtual infrastructure that plays as important a role in society as our physical infrastructure, as our energy networks and as our road networks. And in the same way that our, um, so our road networks help to support businesses, they help us to get from A to B, data is starting to help us to deliver services, create businesses and get to, a, get to navigate to decisions. Um, and one of the issues we have at the moment is we don't plan for, invest in and maintain in our data infrastructure in the same way as we do our physical infrastructure. And that's, I think, the shift in thinking that we need to, we need to make in order to really get the maximum value from um, data um, from all kinds of organizations. Um, and that infrastructure has lots of different components to it. So um, we've tried to define data infrastructure as consisting of data sets, standards, specific technologies, um, policies that guide how data might be being collected or should be used, and also the organizations that help steward that, that data, that infrastructure, in order to make it sustainable and useful over the long term. So you can see part of this definition, it weaves together um, code, data, and standards. Um, and all of those need to be open to get kind of most impact from that infrastructure. Um, we're also increasingly trying to think about ecosystems. So if we're building data infrastructure, what are the different products and services, communities that are supported by that infrastructure? Um, ideally, when we're building infrastructure, we want it to support a whole variety of different purposes. When we build a road, we build a road so that people can um, ride their bike on it, um, drive their car for personal use. They can run a ride sharing company on it. They can run a delivery uh, service on it. We don't um, uh, create infrastructure for pizza delivery and then a road network for people to, um, to drive their cars on. We design infrastructure that supports multiple purposes. And in order to do that, we will need to understand the communities and um, types of uses um, that that infrastructure will support. So we need to think about inf inf the ecosystem. We need to think about the system more broadly. So um, for us, a, a data ecosystems are it consist of the, the data infrastructure and then the people, communities, and organizations that are benefiting from the use of that infrastructure. Um, that are that are um, benefiting from the value of the data that is flowing through that that infrastructure, and if we start to think about that um, that broader context, then it helps us to um, think about how we design um, uh, standards, because we the, if we we need to understand how data is going to be used in order to make sure that that standards um, are fit for purpose, we need to ensure that we're baking in freedoms around how data can be accessed, used and shared so to make sure that um, the broadest set of people have um, equitable access to that data for, uh, to, for business reasons, for personal reasons, or to support the needs of their individual communities. So this kind of systems level thinking is, is really important as we um, think about the um, future of, of data. Um, we started to experiment with ways to try and map and diagram these data ecosystems so that we can start to um, make it a little bit more tangible for people. Um, good infrastructure should be invisible. You don't really think about your electricity supply until it goes off. Um, the problem with our data infrastructure is it's just very uh, poorly designed and maintained at the moment. So anything we can do to uh, make people more conscious of um, how their choices that they make about how data is being published and shared um, will help them think through the downstream impacts on different communities and how they can create value from that data. Um, so just to just to sum up, um, if we want to create um, a world where work data works for everyone, then we need to be building data ecosystems that are open and trustworthy. And by open, it means based on open standards, open source, and open data. And that's the end of my talk. So uh, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Lee. Uh, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I, uh, I've, got, I've got some questions already. I've also uh, got some of my own, so I'm going to use my MC privilege to ask that one first, um, which is, um, so you talked a bit about um, collective 
collaboration in kind of both open source uh, and how that doesn't that hasn't really translated quite as obviously to open data. And you also kind of talked about collective maintenance and open data. Um, it feels to me like like data is still kind of stuck in the capability space that open source was, uh, you know, a couple of decades ago in terms of organizations thinking, oh, our, you know, our, our computer code is our capability and we need it to be um, competitive. And that's the way that people still think about data. Do you think there's a kind of a fundamental difference between these two or is data, is open data just kind of earlier on in the same journey that open source has already trodden? Um, I, to some extent, I think it's just it's just earlier on. I think we're still working through um, some of the um, working through with different communities how they can um, get the benefits from uh, open data, or at least being um, more open to sharing data. Um, so, um, I think the within say the um, scientific community, the the rationale for um, openly licensed um, 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 uh, research outputs is reasonably well understood, um, although there's still some challenges there around um, um, encouraging researchers to share. But it's kind of it's an, it's an example that's pretty well articulated and is starting to be baked into funding policies and expect, uh, community norms and expectations. Um, I think the same is true um, largely around the open government movement. Uh, open data has been kind of core of that, and there's lots of well-articulated, well-described benefits and examples, and Ian touched on a number of them. Um, I think we've still got a lot to do to understand, uh, to help the uh, private sector understand the benefits of um, open data. Um, it's one of the reasons why uh, we're very keen um, to work with the private sector, the ODI, um, because it it, um, it gives us um, experience of working through with them where they feel the the, the challenges or difficulties are with um, um, you know building business cases to make data more open. Um, so I think you know there's still still more work to be done. We have to recognise that different communities are at different levels of maturity. Um, I think on the the bit around collaborative maintenance, um, um, as as I tried to highlight, there's some there are some uh, w really well established projects that know how to do this this well. They've been doing it for twenty odd years, um, but the the experiences of those communities haven't really been, I don't think have been digested and shared enough in ways that could support um, others in exploring a more open and uh, collaborative approach to to maintenance of data um so but that's one of the you know one of the reasons why we we put together that pattern catalog and, and guidebook uh, i've got a question here from thierry ackerman um where does open banking uh, and open banking data sit in all of this um Okay, yeah, so it's a good, that's a good question. And so the ODI was involved in some of the open banking uh, work um, early on. So, um, I mean, open banking is a kind of uh, interesting example of, of where uh, open standards and open data um, and not so open data kind of combine. Um, so the origin of open banking was a um, uh, push from the Competition and Markets Authority um, for the main banks to be... Um, more open about um, more open with data data about their products and to be more open in a in a broader sense to sharing data with um, other organizations that might be able to do more innovative things with our banking records than the uh, bank transaction history and so on that the banks themselves were doing so the the origins of that initiative were in um, uh, uh, government kind of regulatory push. Um, it was started as an open standards project, so agreeing how that data could be published, um, including some uh, public data and some um, data that is only shared under more restrictive licenses. Um, the open banking project has its own license, which is nearly but not quite an open data license. Um, so depending on how um, uh, uh, charitable you want to be, you could say that open banking doesn't actually have any open data at all. 
um, but they're they're nearly there, um, and I've, we've encouraged them to review their licensing a few times. Um, but it, it's it's a good example of how a nudge from government can encourage a sector to be more open. You can see the same thing happening across other sectors at the moment. So the energy sector is doing similar things. Um, water sector, there's some discussions happening there now off what I've got a consultation running. So, um, the, you know, there's, there's lots more to be done in lots of different areas, but um, uh, hopefully that helps uh, highlight where I think it fits in. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks very much. Um, question from um, Anthony Harrison. Uh, I like the concept of the data infrastructure, uh, but where does kind of information or data architecture fit into that? Are these things needed or not needed to ensure that infrastructure can evolve as technologies and standards change as well? Um, so um, the, the data architecture or information architecture is in is in there. It might not be enough, um, evident in the um, in the definition I, I, sh I showed, um, but it so for for me it's part of that um, the de the design um, of individual data assets. It's the it's the standards that are used to um, um, shape how that data is being collected and managed and shared. Um, so I, I think it's in there. It just it just might not be, as, be that um, that obvious for my definition. Um, so I, you know, I, I absolutely agree that you know, a, a good data architecture, um, both in terms of you know the schemas and standards for for the individual data sets and the technical architecture that underpins their management and use and and how they're shared is important as well. Um, alongside our definition of data infrastructure, we also published some principles for developing data infrastructure, and in those principles. Um, uh, we highlighted the need to be agile and to iterate, so to evolve the technology and standards um, based on the needs of the users of that infrastructure. Uh, a question here from uh, John Beard. Um, I think of the progress on open data as about making data into a first-class citizen, just as software systems have become first-class citizens. Would you agree that there's more work to do uh, to, to achieve that? Um, so I'm I'm taking by first class citizen as as um, giving data the pro prominence alongside code and other other key resources, the other assets that organisations maintain. Um, I think um, again. I think some organizations are, are already well down that, that journey. Um, you know, organizations that have always seen themselves as being a steward of a, of, of key data sets. Um, whereas, um, other organizations are, have perhaps been slow to recognize the value of, of some of their data assets and the need to in, invest further in their, in their data maturity and data governance and so on. Um, so, um, Again, I think it's a kind of a, a, t a timing and a, um, a maturity question. And a question from Edward Arms. Uh, it, is there a, an issue, um, the open data idea itself, um, or the lack of visibility of it is a blocker, um, such that, you know, due to a lack of knowledge of open data, systems are designed such that data can't be made open or can't be made open easily? Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question. So, I, so I've, I've been giving talks defining what open data is for like, probably 10 years or so. Um, and I, I, I do occasionally get a little bit tired of uh, repeating the same message. But I think the, one of the main things that I've learned is that there are, that there are so many different communities. There's such a broad audience that might need to understand what open data is or means, and at the same as they still need to understand what open source is and where the value is of that is, that we just need to be consistently um, championing the concept, reinforcing the message, re-articulating the core benefits. Um, I think it's just something that we have to you know, always continue to do to push people to be more open because it isn't our natural tendency in lots of, lots of ways. Um, 
I, th I think until you've started to work in more open ways, you it can be a bit uncomfortable to you know to be sharing things early and often. So there's there's a bit there. I think you know we just all need to continue to to promote the idea. Um, the bit of the question about um, designing systems um, such that data can't be made open. There's there's an interesting challenge there because there's it's I think it's less about the concept of open data and it's more about getting people to understand how um, potentially every decision that they make through um, acquiring or collecting the data through to the point of when it's published might have bearing on whether they actually have the rights and capability to publish data under an under an open license. So. We, I've done um, various projects with private sector organizations who were, were um, very keen to publish open data, but it was only through the process of um, starting to ask questions about how the data was being collected that they realized that actually that maybe they didn't have the rights to publish this data at all um, because it was acquired. Perhaps they'd outsourced some of the data collection and the terms of which on, under which the data was collected gave them free use of it internally, but didn't allow them to share it more broadly. So there's a bit here around just educating people around, I think, data governance um, and good data management practices in general, um, so that we've, they can manage that data better as an asset. And I think from that starting point, you would then be able to make uh, better decisions about how you can open uh, and license data for reuse. And then a, a final question for me, actually, uh, kind of extending that point. Um, in, in in the software space, I feel like open source had a big a big benefit from the ability to to easily share software and and have um, kind of patches changes be contributed backwards. Um, do you think there's well, firstly, do you agree? I could be wrong. Um, but do you think there is a a similar capability that's missing in open data? Or do you think that capability exists, but people just don't use it because they um, they haven't got their data management down in quite the same way that source control is about good software management? Um, so uh, I, th I think there, there is still a need for, for better tools, um, better uh, platforms and systems to help manage data more collaboratively. Um, I've um, I've seen dozens and dozens of projects that have started out with the premise of wanting to be the GitHub for data um, and try to address that problem. Uh, I don't think anyone's quite nailed it yet. And actually, I think sometimes GitHub it, GitHub is probably the best GitHub for data um, because at least they've got um, the, some of the core tools right to allow, allow people to track and manage contributions. Um, but one of the, you know, what, go back to the, the work we did on collaborative maintenance and the guidebook, one of the things we wanted to try and highlight there is just what the common, the good patterns were um, around things like um, managing and reviewing data in a, in a more open way. Um, I think because so few of us have actually worked in the open on a data set in, in, that, in that kind of environment, we don't necessarily understand how um, you can still maintain the data quality if literally anyone can edit the data. Um, you know, how do you unpick um, uh, accidental errors or malicious edits? But within some of these systems, within OpenStreetMap, within Wikipedia, Wikidata, and so on, there's like in some cases 20 years worth of experience of trying to manage that in through um, community and sometimes automated um, approaches. So I think we just need to surface more of those and, and then we can use that to create some of these better tools.